Now, there's another observational thing which is a bit nearer to home for you here, and that's the melting of the Arctic ice. The, this line shows what the scientists refer to as the anomaly, the uh, uh, amount of the area of ice that's melted each year between 1978, and I can't quite see the end one, but it's somewhere around about 2007. Um, and uh, you can see for a long time, nothing very much happens. There's a slight fall. But ever since towards the middle of the 90s, the curve has been steepening and steepening. And if that were the profit curve of some firm, I think the CEO would be in a panic by now about, <laughs> about the thing. And there's a lot of similarity between climate change and the economic system. They're both a mess of nonlinear differential equations and liable to do things like that. The little red dots near the top of the diagram are what the IPCC predicted would happen. And you can see how very far away they are from the actual happenings of the Earth. And again, the, what they're predicting is much less frightening than what is really happening. Now, when all of that ice goes, and the, the reckoning is it could be any time between five and 30 years, not all that long ahead. Um, when all of it goes, the dark sea that's exposed will absorb the sunlight in the summer season, uh, whereas before, the sunlight was reflected almost completely by the white ice. As a consequence, the extra heat added to the Earth is nearly one watt uh, per square meter all over the Earth when you average it right out. And that's about the same as the greenhouse gases we've added to the atmosphere now. So in a relatively short time, global heating is due to double. Now, most of the Earth's ocean is still quite cold. The lower waters are only four degrees Celsius down near the bottom perhaps a memory of the last ice age, which is only 14,000 years ago. But fortunately for us, uh, the cold water at the lower parts of the ocean doesn't readily mix with the warm surface waters. Otherwise, we could be cold for a very long time and, be, and we'll be worrying more about that than heating. But even a small change in the rate of turnover of the ocean waters can hugely affect climate. And maybe this is why it is cooler just now. But it would be dangerous to think that it could be explained so simply. It's much more likely that our inability to forecast the present climate confirms the complexity of the Earth system and that our models are very incomplete. It shouldn't surprise us that the climate scientists have had to reduce their vision of the Earth to something that can be managed. And so far, they've only had time to come to terms with the gases of the atmosphere. And indeed, many IPCC scientists acknowledge this limitations. They know that the oceans, the clouds, and the surface are important, but they're still only partially understood. The biosphere, its response and its effects are still almost completely unknown. For the past 40 years, I've worked on a, a different way of looking at the Earth, uh, seeing it as a dynamic system that includes an active and responsive biosphere. And of course, this is Gaia theory. To, to use it means turning away from the established science of past centuries and seeing our planet as a new and incompletely understood for even form of life. If we do this, surprisingly, it becomes easier to understand and more predictable. And interestingly, the first suggestion that we should do this uh, was made by the eminent American scientist, Alfred Lotka, as long ago as 1925. We know that the Earth is a dynamic system of great complexity, but we also know that the same is true of one of us, a human. Uh, we are incredibly complex things, 
um, made up of billions of cells all operating in a dynamic collaboration. But we don't think of ourselves that way. We see ourselves as whole persons, and our response is fairly predictable and understandable. So cli if climate scientists think of the Earth as a collection of separate parts, not as a whole live planet, they are bound to find it dauntingly complex and difficult. And they will remain unable to forecast future climates until they model the Earth as something as alive and able to respond and evolve when the climate changes. It's true that the IPCC includes parts of the biosphere in their models, but they, they don't include it dynamically. They put it in a single part, more or less as a passenger on a ship, not as part of the working crew. So what justifies this living Earth approach? Well, I think the easiest way to explain it is to think about the, our sister planets, Venus and Mars. Now, the Earth sits in between them, but um, astrobiologists tell us that all three of them started off with similar compositions and had plenty of water. Conventional wisdom has it that the Earth is at exactly the right distance from the sun for life to flourish. Venus too hot, Mars too cold. Well, this must have been true three and a half billion years ago when life started, or we wouldn't be here talking about it today. But since then, the sun has increased its heat by nearly 30%. And you don't have to do many suns to show that the sun's heat is now much too hot for life here at the Earth's present orbital position. We're no longer at the Goldilocks point. We're, in the, we're much too close to the fire. So how do we all exist? Well, Gaia theory says that the Earth is cool, moist, and with an oxygen-rich atmosphere, and with CO2 pumped down to almost a trace gas at only a few hundred parts per million, despite a too hot sun, because the presence of life keeps it this way. Quite simply, the evolution of life and its environment as a single entity has provided an atmosphere that's just right in composition for sustaining a habitable planet.